So back from Hot Springs, um, I really wanted to film a whole bunch of stuff, but the reality is, man, we're just so busy. Um, so where we're at right now, uh, the week's over. Um, trust me, you're going to want to catch that last episode of Warlord, man. It's going to be a blast. That bomber car is amazing. I have never, ever had a two buggy function that well right out of the gate. Blew my mind. Absolutely awesome. So where I'm at right now is this. Look at this shop. This is what a shop looks like after a thrash to finish a car. I mean, look at, look at, just look at the garbage, piles of garbage, all kinds of garbage bags. I had to dig through my storage box of plumbing stuff to find things. There's just tools and monster everywhere and half drank coffee cups and a hundred cut zip ties. The floor becomes a toolbox uh, just to hold tools and the place just gets, it just gets written off. I mean, written off. So the plan is I wanted to clean it today, but I can't. I have to get on a plane tomorrow morning uh, to fly out to do some stuff with Aesop for Spark Week. Um, so basically today I got to do some shuffling around. I got to take my buddy Ricky Berry back his truck and trailer that I borrowed when I blew up the Colorado on UA. So I'll get that back to him. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of cleanup here, but I'm not going to be able to do a lot. Um, and then I'm just going to basically, I guess, go home and pack and back <laughs> to get back on the road. Oh, uh, this time of year is crazy. It always is. So this is what happens in October. In October, we just get crazy busy because we got so much stuff stacked up. You know, now UA is in October. It used to be in June. So that's gets stacked on there. And then I got the final episode of Four Wheeler. I got to knock it out. Then I got to get ready for SEMA. This year, I'm doing some stuff with eBay Motors. So I got to get a vehicle ready for that. Luckily, it's one that's already built. I just got to go through it, make sure it's good and good to go, and then deliver it to Moab. Then it's SEMA. And then it's fab tech then maybe we'll be able to take a breath and get back to just doing some some work here in the shop because i got a bunch of stuff i gotta i gotta work on i just honestly do so sorry i didn't get more behind the scenes stuff filmed but no joke it was three 20 hour days and it was just work 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 and i just didn't have time to pick up a camera there was no way if i did there's no way we were going to be able to get that car over to hot springs for the last episode of four wheeler and uh yeah trust me you're gonna want to watch that one so in the meantime right now i think i'm gonna just do some cleaning up and then uh get ready to prep the shop truck for ebay so this is something that i probably honestly don't do often enough basically what i'm doing to do this cleanup if you own a shop you do a lot of metal work in you know exactly what i'm talking about every now and then you just have to pull everything away from the walls sweep all that metal dust out of there give the floor a good clean and then uh put stuff back it's also a good time you know maybe shake things up a little bit move things around inside your shop that's what i'm doing right now i used to have the the yukon box uh in this spot right here but my good buddy ricky berry bought me this a while ago this is like a wall bar it's something kind of cool <laughs> basically just droop drop her down and we got a little spot to keep some whiskey i'm putting it on my this whole wall seems to sort of be whiskey themed in this part of the studio. Uh, we originally, you know, up front has a whole bunch of whiskey stuff. Um, but this kind of just sort of brings it all out here into the shop. Because, you know, I'm a big fan of that high quality whiskey. So I think what I'm going to do now is I might move my uh, Tecton toolbox over to this side as well. And then just sort of change up how I have... Uh, this, this section of the shop. I'm going to move those uh, Aesop welders into storage. They're just kind of backups. Just kind of ended up spilling there not too long ago. So I'm just going to keep cleaning, keep sweeping. Hopefully tomorrow I'll have a shop. So now I basically have this section pretty much done uh i still think i want to pull out my metal bench sweep in behind there uh and maybe make some changes i got a bunch of scrap metal over there that normally i would just throw away but honestly uh price of dom right now is through the roof so i kind of hold on to everything at this point so i want to get probably pick up something to store all that stuff in uh i've kind of got a pail right now but i think i'm going to get like two more pails and break it down into like round tubing square tubing and then just miscellaneous that way i have it um but i was going to stop and then pull the jeep in and start working on it but i think what i'm going to do right now is just keep going you know i've got 
This corner here just becomes a catch-all just all the time. And this is just two shelves that are double stacked. And those are all my drop sheets off the plasma table. But I have a plan for those, so I'm not going to throw those out. I'm actually going to keep them. I got an idea I'm going to show you later in the year. But uh, basically, I got to deal with all my fluids over here. You can see what I do is I keep all my DEF jugs uh, from my diesel. And then what I do is I dump my oil into the DEF jugs. That's how I take it to the parts store just to get rid of it. But uh, I think what I want to do is... Clean up this section right here, and that way it does, looks like less of a mess. And uh, I also have some fenders to put on my trailer. I may bang that out as well today. But I think my plan is to just keep going. I might as well just do this whole shop, all 5,000 square feet of it, one shot. That way it's done, and then I'm not fighting this constantly for the next month, which is what's going to happen. So I think if I just take a couple days right now and just keep rolling... While I've got this corner cleaned out, I kind of use it for two things. Number one, I keep all of my oil and junk there because then it's just easy to get into stuff, transport out the door. And then, although I don't clean cars often, uh, I keep this little auto detailing stool kind of tucked away in the corner as well. But one thing that I am super excited about is I found this not too long ago and I just, it was brilliant because I got a pressure washer, big gas powered one. But it ha kind of has to dance between here and the house because sometimes I need it here, sometimes I need the house. And then I was kind of shopping around for pressure washers that I could have here. I was just gonna go buy another gas one, but this one had to get. Check this thing out. So this is from Giraffe Tools, okay? So this is a Giraffe Tools wall-mounted electric pressure washer. So the cool thing is it's got 100 feet of hose on this reel the pressure washer is built into it and then it will just mount on the wall so once it's mounted up there i'll always have a pressure washer easy to use when i need to use it and it's got 100 feet of retractable cable so when i don't need it i can just let it roll back up in i don't have to roll the pressure washer around constantly i'm super stoked about this because i did a lot of research about which ones i liked and i like that one and when I was about to buy it, the crazy thing is, is Giraffe Tools actually reached out to me and said, hey, would you like to uh, put one of our pressure washers in your shop? And I was like, yes, yes, I would. Because I was literally about to hit add to cart on that bad boy on Amazon. Um, I'll let you know how well it works. Um, I'm probably going to foam cannon off the uh, off the Colorado out there pretty soon. So uh, once I get it up and mounted, maybe I'll uh, fire it up and we'll see how well it works. But right now I'm going to mount it on the wall right by the time.
Okay, so the pressure washer's hung. That was relatively painless, really. That's one nice thing about this Miracle Trust building. Having those two by sixes uh, running sideways through the entire wall. The way this works, there's a two by six every two feet. So when it comes to mounting stuff, like I said, it's super simple. Just throw some lags into that two by six, and there you go. And so you can see uh, basically the way this works. It's got 100 feet of uh, pressurized line right here. You got a cool little holster back here to hold the actual pressure washer gun or wand, or whatever you want to call it. There's a spot to hold all the things even comes on these little foam cannon deals which is awesome because i literally just bought one of those to have at the house uh, so now i've got one here too so there now i think what i'll eventually do is there is a water line way up there when i plumb this building i have a three quarter inch water line coming pretty sure it comes through somewhere in that area what i'll probably do eventually is punch through that wall grab that water line run a whole new water line basically tilt this bad boy up run it above the door come down and then do a drop right here beside the pressure washer that way i don't have to hook up this hose every time i can just have it plumbed and ready to rock and then uh and then i'll have that there and then i do need to run some more electrical uh down this side of the shop anyway so i'll add a uh 110 outlet specifically just for that pressure washer and then what i'll probably do just for safety probably do a gfci breaker in the panel um and just run a single feed to that pressure washer since that's obviously going to be a wet area now um that way i know i don't have to worry about it but if, the nice thing about conduit is at a circuit is just punch more wires through that conduit so i got to run some more conduit down here but that's an in-between season job i got two more things got to knock out from motor trend before i can put on my electrician hat and uh, go back to building man because i got to do some work up front too but stoked about that got that done got that corner all cleaned up i uh, like that now i'm just going to move down uh do these tire this tire machine area clean all this junk up deal with these shelves shelves have become kind of a catch-all but there is method to that madness i promise you but i don't like where they are i need to park them somewhere else so that's what's going to happen next this is what my toolbox looks like after a mad thrash of building no matter how many times i tell myself that I'm not gonna do that. The next time I put a car together, I'm gonna put the tool away every time I use it. It never happens. I just end up then piled on every flat surface in the shop. There's tools all over that table. Uh, I already cleaned the tools off that bench. There were tools stacked up on this table. I cleaned them off. This table still has tools stacked up on it that I gotta deal with. And even this, and I mean, this table was only empty for like three hours when we were finishing the car it has tools on it and then this was empty for maybe half a day and then it had tools on it i mean every flat surface in a shop becomes a toolbox when you're thrashing to get a car done it just happens so now is the joyful time of cleaning them all and putting them all over is cleaned off now i'm going to deal with these shelves that i was telling you about i already moved all my plasma table drops those are the sheets that i have off the table and i told you i got something pretty cool playing with those but i'll uh, explain that later so the way these shelves work is basically what i do is that's an entire project so that's everything i need to finish the comanche and then there's some stuff in the middle for that's that still needs to go on the willie's wagon and then the one behind or sorry no scratch that those seats up there for the comanche but that's this is all willie's wagon and then this this one behind it is comanche and volkswagen bug that way everything is just in one spot when i need to uh work on it but what i need to do right now is get ready to bring the shop truck in because i got to prep it to go on the ebay uh parts of america tour and that means I got to get it to Moab next week. And I just need to bring it in. Just do a couple freshening up things on it. Nothing crazy. Um, but that's why I'm cleaning the shop. Just because I needed to, my brain was just, it was, it was insane. So, but being, saying that, uh, the plan will be once the shop truck is done, the Comanche will then go onto the lift. It's ready to go on the lift and basically get the rear axle out. So my plan right now is to move it out of the way um get the fab table over into this studio because 
At the same time, when I start working on the Comanche, uh, my files have started to come in uh, from Jason at JEH Consulting, uh, DIY Off-Road. He started to build out my files for the VW thing, and that's all gonna be assembled on that fab table. So I wanna get it in position, so when I start getting stuff cut, I can go ahead and get it prepped on there. So the Comanche is just gonna get moved out of the way for now, but with the idea that what it's gonna do is it's gonna end up on the lift, so I need to position it somewhere in the shop, so once the shop truck goes out, the Comanche can come back in. This bench was one of my early fab tables, but it kind of just ends up honestly being a catch-all for, for a lot of stuff. As a matter of fact, I actually rebuilt a lot of transmissions on this bench, believe it or not. Here's a little tip for you that uh, a lot of people might not think of. So you can get these books at uh, pretty much anywhere. I think you can get most parts stores. And um, I used to use these books when I taught high school uh, for all the kids, because basically you can get them for, uh, this book does 204 har the 400, the 700, and uh, front wheel drive transaxles, the 125, the 3T40, which is basically the same transmission but computer controlled, 440T4 and the 4T60, same thing. Um, and the reason I like these books is that when I used to use them to teach, uh, they give you like legit step-by-step -step on how to disassemble and reassemble a transmission. I keep them around because, you know, even though I could rebuild a 400, probably with my mind turned off, um, sometimes, and this is the secret about transmissions that everyone needs to know, uh, when, they're bit, when they're putting transmissions together from the factory, sometimes there's like subtle changes inside that box that you don't know about. So to find like the be all end all, this is how you put a transmission back together, it doesn't exist. Um, basically the way it works is when you take the transmission apart, you pay attention to everything and you put it back together. The problem is when you start mixing and max, max <laughs> when you start mixing and matching a lot of boxes together, like I do, you don't get to take apart the same transmission and put the same transmission back together. Because sometimes you're pulling, like on a 400, I try to get the planetaries out of a 4L80 because they're straight cut, therefore they're stronger. So things like that, sometimes there's going to be things inside that transmission that are different from box to box, especially if you're, like let's say you're taking two turbo 400s apart. Let's say you got a turbo 400 that's zippered the case, broken the case, and you got to build one good turbo 400 out of it. Well, sometimes there's going to be things inside the turbo 400. The new one that you get to tear down might be slightly different. And the nice thing about this book is those things are actually covered in here because uh, it's going to be hard to find just right at the basically the top. But when you're putting it back together, it'll say, um, it'll give you little pieces of information. Like here it says, you know, uh, remove the retaining ring. Note that this ring is chamfered. It'll tell you which way the chamfer goes just in case you forget or in case the person who built the transmission before you put it in backwards because that's actually the biggest risk. You get a 400 that someone's rebuilt, rebuilt. You get into it and start messing around. Sometimes it's not put together correctly and that's why it burned down. Um, and so sometimes having those little things inside this book become very handy. So if you're getting into transmission rebuilding, I've always said before, Turbo 400, super simple, stupid simple, tractorishly crude to work on and can handle a lot of abuse. That's the nice thing with the 400. You get into 400, you rebuild it. Um, it's hard to mess it up, to be honest with you. If you want to get into uh, rebuilding transmissions, get this book, get yourself a 400, rebuild it for your rig, you know, and then just do like one upgrade. Do a manual valve body. Follow the instructions for the manual valve body follow that book and you'll build a baller transmission. If you're looking for parts, um, I would say the parts I like to use, I like to go to Monster Transmission because honestly they have everything. Like I can call them up and say, hey, I'm looking for a set of straight cut planetaries out of a 4L80 and they'll ship them to me. They'll sell them to me and ship them to me. I don't need to get a whole other transmission just to get that planetary gear set because they've got piles and piles and piles and piles of parts. So like I said, if you're looking to get into rebuilding transmissions, 400 is a great start and uh, if you follow this book um, and rebuild it you should be in good shape the part that gets tricky about transmissions is diagnosing when there's a problem so like 400 hundreds of times i get phone calls from people be like oh hey Ian, i just rebuilt this 400 
and now I have no reverse. What do I do? Well, that's when diagnosis comes into play. And that is not covered in this book. That is really, you need to understand hydraulic flow and all that kind of jazz. It gets a little tricky, but the good thing is, is the internet is full of that information and you can find it. And here's a tip. If you get in a 400 and it has no reverse, uh, drive it forward, drop it into first gear. If it has engine braking, then it's a problem in the drum because what's happening is, um, the the engine braking is by the band, the pin that holds the band. If you don't have engine braking, then the band pin is too short. You need a longer uh, pin for the band, which is a very common problem in the 400 because not a lot of people, when they rebuild them, not a lot of people measure that uh, band pin. They just throw whatever's in it back in it. Sometimes you ain't got no reverse. You can cheat it by actually welding a little bit on the end of that band pin if you want to. Maybe I'll do a video on how to rebuild Turbo 400. That could be kind of fun. I'll try to get one and we'll do one for you guys. All right, but for now, I just wanted to give you that little tip and trick while I saw this uh, this uh, manual sitting on my bench with, oh, look, what are the chances? More tools on a bench. Okay, so I'll go put those away and then uh, we'll just keep cleaning. More tools, more tools. All right, so I've moved the fab table over here. And one thing that I do need to do, uh, this table's not what's called nitrile coated. Um, I don't really need a nitrile coated table um, because I, I, what, I, what I do instead is I make sure to spray down everything with the anti-spatter stuff. Um, while I'm welding it, like when I had the bomber up here, made sure to every joint, any spatter, always made sure to keep track of the table, make sure there's no any spatter going on. One thing I do have though is a little bit of staining on the table, and that's just from having, you know, engine, transmission, transfer case. Like a lot of stuff were up in here. I think a little bit of uh, fluid leaked out of the transmission got on it. It's not hurting the table at all, but it does leave a little bit of a mark on it. I sprayed down with some brake clean, got most of it off. But uh, what I'm gonna do now, I'm just gonna run over the whole table with just some 220 um, on the DA. It's not gonna affect the surface flatness of it at all. I mean, you're not gonna sand that table. It's like five eighths of an inch thick. You're not gonna knock any of that down with a little bit of 220, but I'll just clean it up while I get ready. Uh, this is like super long-term project, uh, but it's the next thing that's gonna go on this chassis on this table rather, is a chassis that I'm building for my VW thing. And with this table empty, this is just a good time to start getting the parts out, mainly just because they're sitting in different tables all over the shops, because I had to get a bunch of those parts together, get them out, get them scanned, get them measured, uh, so they could draw the chassis. So I got a bunch of stuff that's just laying around. And so what I want to do is I want to get it out, get it up here on the fab table, so I can look at it, play around a little bit, and uh, who knows, maybe uh, if I got some time, I may start cutting out my front end. I do have my front end files and I have everything I need for my front end. And that would be kind of a fun little few day little project uh, to knock out just cause man, I love welding junk together and having that plasma table and running that table all day and welding all day. That's like legit makes me happy inside in my little heart. So I'm just gonna clean up this table and then lay some parts out on it. I'm laying this stuff up mainly just to clean off a couple tables, like I said. So this is uh, PME hubs. These are my front hubs. Um, uh, knuckle kit from CarTech Off-Road. This is all long travel sand car stuff. And it's going with a set of these Method race uh, wheels, uh, five lug, wide five VW 15 inch wheels. And that's because this is the start of my long travel VW thing that is going to be powered by a Tesla engine. Uh, just laying this out right now. I'm not going to start working on it yet, but this stuff just kind of, like I said, has been just been kicking around the shop. So it's time to lay it out, get it all in one place where it's good and safe, which it is right now. Um, I may mess around with it a little bit, but uh, that's it for today. Shop's clean. I'm feeling super good about it. So the plan will be tomorrow. We'll get the shop truck in here, get working on it because it needs to come. It needs to get ready for the eBay, uh, parts of America tour. And so that's what we're going to call it quits for today. We'll be back tomorrow with the shop truck. So a new day here in the shop. And, uh, the goal today is to get the shop truck down here this afternoon. Uh, but I got to go pick up my trailer. And also I'm going to be delivering that shop truck out to Moab for the eBay parts of America tour. Uh, they offered to pick it up, but, uh, um, their dates didn't jive with my dates. And so I was just like, you know what? I'll just deliver it to Moab. And so that's what I'm going to do. 
And, but to do that, I got to throw it on my trailer. And I got the big trailer, could haul with that. I've hauled with that many times. Um, it's a great trailer, does great long distances. But my little trailer, it also does great. This little trailer, I've had it for years now. This trailer is like a hand-me-down. Started with my buddy Bill McClister, who you've seen with me a bunch of times. Um, it was his trailer, and then he handed it down to me, and then it became my trailer. And this trailer has literally towed a rig into every state in the United States. That's not an exaggeration. It's been to Moab a couple times. It's been to Hammers a couple times. It's been down to Florida uh, for a family deal. It's been up to Maine for Ultimate Adventure. And it's been all the way up to Washington State for a Yukon Adventure Trek. So this trailer really has hit all four corners of the United States. And it needs some love. As you can see, the, the fenders aren't that good. You know, they've kind of been beat down and beat up pretty good. Um, the lights need some work. Um, these lights are fine. These lights are good, but uh, uh, the light at the very back, I broke that a while ago, so I think I should replace that. And then this fender is the really bad fender. You can see this poor fender. I've towed with it like this. It looks so janky driving down the highway with this thing just flopping in the wind like that. So embarrassing. So what I did was last time I was over down at Motobilt picking up uh, a bed actually for Gladiator, I grabbed some of his uh, trailer fenders. These are awesome fenders. They're 3 16 steel, so they're full-on drive-over fenders. And uh, they will basically replace the fenders that are on the trailer and look better, be stronger, and I can drive over them. And so I'm going to do that. I'm going to throw a new jack on the front, and then I may even toss a winch mount into it. I'm not sure if I'm going to have time for that today or not. I'd like to, though. Uh, I've got a trailer tongue box coming. I might wait to do the winch until the tongue box comes because I'm kind of thinking about putting the winch inside the tongue box and that way I don't have to worry about it. Uh, it does need new wood on it, but that's not a today job. The wood that's there is doing its job and it'll last another three, four years and then I'll do a full wood replacement on it and probably at the same time paint the whole thing. But I definitely want to get the fenders done and get my new jack on it because the jack's pretty janky. And I, have, I carry two spares with this and I put them in the bed of my truck, but I'd like to, if I have time today, knock out... Uh, two spare tire mounts on the front as well but the problem with that is I may have to wait for the tongue box on that too because I don't know where the tongue box is going to land versus the spare tire mount where they're going to land so it's complicated it's complicated so but first things first I'm going to cut those old fenders off get the tires out of the way cut those old fenders off and go You can see this hub lost its dust shield at some point in time. And I don't know if it has lost the dust shield and the, everything's just backed out or if a bearing shot inside of that. So what I'll do right now is pull that apart, take a look at it, and then we'll see what it looks like. Ooh, that is not happy in there. Look at that. Oh. That's all greasy and grody and disgusting. Look at that. Seal gone out of that drum. Okay. Bearing actually isn't too bad. Seal actually doesn't look too bad either. It's kind of crazy when you think about it. But look at the inside of that drum. Golly. That is covered. So the way these trailer brakes work is this is a little electromagnet and when it, when it energizes it basically just grabs onto the drum and just pushes these shoes out by the movement of the drum but you can see like man i guess i'll have to try to find some ideally would be to find some trailer brake shoes and at the, at the very least we got to clean that up huh yeah. At the very least. We can put this in the parts washer, clean it. 
Nice thing is there's no grooves and everything. She's just dirty. She's just dirty. Just dirty and greasy. Well, I think the plan will be just to clean it up and then make a decision. So based on what I see right here, it almost looks like, I mean, the bearings, the outer bear, the inner bearing's good. I'll pop that outer bearing off, take a look at it. It looks good. I think uh, what I'll do is just pull everything down, clean it all up and take a look at it. But I mean, it doesn't look, uh, spindle still looks good, which is the important part. Um, I do carry an extra hub with me whenever I travel. So if this had happened to me on the side of the road, I honestly could have pulled this all apart, unbolted this and literally put a new hub on it. Not what I want to do on the side of the highway. So I think the smart move here is basically, like I said, I'll clean this all up, evaluate it then, and then put it all back together. So I went ahead and pulled the other side apart, fully expecting to see the exact same thing as the one side, but I didn't. The good news is, is it is perfect. No, there's no grease in with the shoes at all. Perfectly good, shoes are still good everything looks great in there so obviously the one side has the wrong seal in it uh, now comes the tricky part finding a seal haha good news is if you look here this seal actually has a part number on it you can cut let me see if i can get a zoom in on there for you so all these national seals the part number will be on it somewhere so you can see it's a national right there i just got to clean this all up and hope that there's a part number on here somewhere and if not what I'll have to do is I will have to pop that seal out, see if it fits in the other drum. That's the question. I don't know if someone replaced the drum or just replaced the seal, uh, but I found some silicone in and around the seal. So it looks like my guess is the seal didn't quite fit right and I threw some silicone on it hoping it would hold it in there and it just, it just doesn't, it just can't. Seal's gotta be like a press fit. So I'm hoping if I find a part number on that seal, I can look it up, see where it is, see if my part store has it, I can throw a seal in it. I actually ended up taking the entire brake assembly off. It's just four bolts. I took the entire brake assembly off and uh, put it in the parts washer. It honestly, I tried cleaning it with brake clean. I was gonna be here all day and probably go through 10 cans of brake clean. It's only two wires, just hooks up to that uh, brake. So. That's what I'm gonna, gonna do right now. I gotta go to the parts store anyway to get a, a new light for that back section right there. So it's not a big deal, but uh, finding that seal will be the next thing. So I'm gonna compare the drums, I'm gonna measure them, compare them, then we'll go from there. So I went down to the parts store and picked up the seal and uh, here's what I found. Well, basically, even the new seal, the new seal in the drum was loose. Here, look at this. Right, you can see it's just not tight enough and i think that was the problem originally you can see there's some silicone around here so a couple options here option one is you can get what's called a speedy sleeve which is basically a machine piece of steel that would hammer in the outside of this and bring this outside in and then you could put that seal back in there but for a hundred bucks you can get a whole new drum and you can see i got this whole new drum it is uh it's a replacement drum same bolt pattern same everything when you do this before you commit to greasing everything up and making it work what you want to do is you want to check so the drum kit will come with new bearings this is my inner bearing you want to test fit the bearings on the spindle so this one fits fine on there and then the outer bearing i already got a little bit of grease on it just by test fit it it fits the outside fine so those are good so basically the solution here is just go ahead buy a new drum if they had had two i would have bought them but they didn't have two, it's only about one. Um, what I'll probably do is order a second one and uh, keep it in the tongue box that I'm gonna put on this trailer. What I like to do is, like I said before, I carry a hub, so I've got a hub. On my big bad boy trailer, I carry a whole kit. I carry the hub, the drum, the brakes, everything for that trailer just to have it in the trailer with me. And so for this one, I'll just end up carrying an extra hub and then the extra drum and the drum has the hub in it type of thing. So I think we're in good shape. So I'll be able to get this fixed. Um, it's not the fix I wanted to do, but I sure am glad I found the problem. Um, my tires, I think I'm gonna go ahead and just put my two spares on the trailer and then I'm gonna order four new tires. I called around, I can get tires from discount, but it's like, I can get four brand new tires from Amazon, put them on myself here with my own tire machine for the price of two of their tires. So I think I'll run with my 
one spare on for this trip uh, carry the bad tire I, all, I, have an, I always carry two spares on trips uh, so I'll have, I'll have a, th that one will go on there if I have to put it on I can't see mis myself needing it but that'll be the plan and then I'll just order four new tires when I get back and just swap them or maybe just one I don't know yeah probably four new tires it's about time this trailer gets tires I do tires in this trailer every couple of years um, they're not much it's 300 bucks for four good 10 ply trailer tires and so it's worth just swapping them out especially the amount of miles this trailer gets so I'm gonna go ahead and put the brakes back on wire that back together put the drum back on and then all the bearings will be sealed up and then I'm gonna cut the fenders off Now that that's done, I can actually start on the job that I brought the trailer in here to do in the first place, which was replace the fenders on both sides with my new drive over motor built ones. First step, cut all these old fenders off and make room for the new So now I've got all the old fender off, all the old supports off. The one support I did leave alone was this little piece of angle iron here. Um, because that's where the old fender used to sit. And I might be able to peel the piece of sheet metal off on the inside and actually use it as a support on the motor built fender instead of basically starting from scratch. So what I'm gonna do is just sort of test fit everything right now and see what it looks like. And then I'll make that decision. So I actually kind of like that. Um, it gives me just a little bit extra, it makes things a lot easier because I can just set that in there at the center. Um, it'll hold the fender at the right height. And then I can basically just uh, weld down either side and then cut the filler plate to fit in from there. Um, it looks like 
Dan makes these filler plates, this filler plate here, <coughs> to go on the outside right here, which I was thinking that I may try to get it to sit on the inside, but now that I know I'm gonna use that piece of angle, I think I will trim it to sit on this outside edge. So I'm gonna do a little bit more grinding, and then, uh, then I think I'll set up the welder and uh, start welding these in. Stoked. Super, I like that a lot. This is going to be, be way better than what I had before. now that one fender's on there and like you can compare the two, I understand how janky I must have looked driving down the road with this trailer. I mean, I was towing vehicles with these fenders on there. I must have looked so bad when I could have looked so good. Like, look at this. This looks so much better. Oh my goodness gracious. Oh, Ian, so sad. Like, look at that fender. That fender's like legit. That makes this trailer look, you know, like a trailer that should be hauling up. <laughs> I had vehicles on here that were worth conservatively like $100,000, and I'm rolling around with those fenders. That's embarrassing. Okay, but anyway, so one fender's on. It's good. Uh, filler plate was in. Uh, one thing that I should tell you, I'll show you when I do it on the other side. I actually had to cut the filler plate down, and I actually used my plasma cutter because I could have got out the plant hand plasma, but there's no way it would have been as straight. So I just did it with the plasma table. I'll show you how I did that when we go back over there. But all right, so now that this side's done, I'll do the same thing to the other. cut four and a half inches off the bottom of this filler plate and I honestly could do it with the hand plasma but then it'd just be a long straight line the chance of me getting it perfectly straight would be pretty slim to none so what I did is I just drew a straight line on the plasma table 63 inches long which is how long I need to cut I basically have this thing set up right here uh, I know where it's gonna start it's basically gonna start start right here it's gonna pierce go up an inch and then cut all the way across and then I'll have a uh, a nice straight cut on the bottom of this filler piece and it'll fit in there perfect 
Just another way to use a plasma table. Gonna finish the fenders off with some of this uh, spray Herculiner truck bed liner. I've used it on a couple of projects so far. I actually used it on the frame for the Colorado and I really liked it. It reminded me of the old school Duplicolor bed liner, which I absolutely loved. Eventually, I think I'll do this whole trailer in this uh, Herculiner, but that will be after I do the winch mount and the, and the tongue box and the new jack and all that kind of stuff. Today is just fenders, fix that hub, and that's all I'm gonna do.